And welcome everyone to Economic Tourism and Culture Development, Tuesday, March 26. I call to order for approval of the agenda. Councilor Tweel, Councilor McAleer, second. Declaration of conflict of interest. Seeing none. Approval of the minutes from January 22nd, 2024. If anybody had a chance to look over them. Approved. Uh, Councilor McAleer, thank you. Any business arising from the minutes? Seeing none, I'm going to move on to uh, reports and discussions. In the first presentation, um, I'll have Wayne introduce the gentleman from Atlantic Moose. Mr. Long. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have a presentation today from uh, a group um, who would like to speak to us about the potential of a CFL expansion organization here in the capital city. Uh, I'm unaware who's joining us on the call today. My apologies, I don't have uh, names, so I'll allow the, uh, the uh, presenters to um, identify themselves. Thank you, Mr. Long. Hello, I think the first name is Ray, so go ahead, please identify or you're, uh, yes, this is, yeah, so this is uh, Ray from the Atlantic Canada Moose, just me here today speaking on behalf of the initiative. Okay, Ray, do you have a presentation to go through to where? Yeah, so, yeah, so I believe um, we sent about uh, a, a short video that we made available to Mr. Long uh, concerning a, sort of a synoptic uh, encapsulation of what the uh, what our free CFL franchise initiative entails. Um, and we sent also, I believe, was something to members of council, a urban concept plan, sort of a, a layout of what, what our conception is all about. And basically, what the initiative is about in terms of the um, CFL expansion franchise is that it's not just a ex initiative to ex for a CFL franchise, but it's a multifaceted proposal which incorporates um, uh, with that, of course, an outdoor stadium would be the island's first outdoor stadium would be multi-purpose in, in, in concept and a extensive uh, sort of a social housing infrastructure as part of the concept of the development surrounding the um, stadium would be um, social housing, which is above ground and on ground space, and as well as, as um, arts and uh, sort of artistic, cultural per uses, center uses, and center the um, stadium facility. In terms of my own background, um, my own background is be back in urban planning and urban and economic geography from the um, University of Toronto, um, as well as other sort of degree backgrounds, including business law, which I also. Uh, Ray, we're getting a lot of background noise. Uh, we're not. Oh, I see. We're not getting your clear presentation, sir. Oh. I'm not sure why that is. Do you want me to hang up and, and try to restart again? No, no. Um, it just sounds like there's almost like somebody's talking in the background or something. Like an echo. Yeah, there's, there's no noise. I can assure you there's no other sound behind me. Maybe I have more than... Okay, wait a second. Maybe I have more than one window open. Just a second. Let me see. Um, yeah, there's no there's no sound behind me, so maybe I'm there's more than one window open. Nope. The only way for me to possibly eliminate that is if I close all the windows and join back on. Yeah. No, no, Maybe carry on. Uh, carry on. Carry on? Okay. Yeah. So I apologize for the um, echo. I don't know what's going on there. So um, I apologize for that. So, yeah. So basically what we're here today before uh, council is that we're hoping to get the, um, based upon what we've already presented, Council in terms of what our concept is about. Um, in our view, 
um, this is a great initiative on the island. The island and, and as a tourist-based economy, and the Charlottetown is an integral part of that. And in our view, um, the sort of the CFL initiative, the driving force of community economic development. This is why we have gotten the support from the Greater Charleston Chamber of Commerce. They provided us with a written endorsement. Uh, they were initially had work about two years ago, and they renewed um, this year. I believe that member was um, stipulated to council. So they are definitely supporting what our, what our concept is about, and our and our interest today is to um, see to what extent we might get. Blessings from council or the initiative in a similar way uh, that we uh, received support from the Greater Charlotte Commerce. And with that said, I work here to add if there are any um, questions that His Worship or members of council might have for the initiative, because I can talk on and on, but there might be some lingering questions that you have. So I didn't want to take up all your time by talking. When you might have had, based upon the material you were already reading, that we distributed to you along. Okay, Ray, we're going to ask Cindy to play the video here so we can uh, re uh, review it. Welcome to the Atlantic Moose. We're an effort to bring a 10th CFL team and so much more. An amazing multi-purpose outdoor stadium for amateur and other professional sports events, a community center complex for events, above-ground social housing units in an attractive environment, on-ground locally owned retail stores, arts slash culture and live theater along with an amphitheater, an outdoor dance floor by spring, summer and fall becomes an ice skating rink by winter. That's what Confederation Square is all about. Young families, single professionals, seniors, all diversities. A fun place to visit to celebrate our national game. An amazing place to live. We're a consortium of community stakeholders. We seek to make the Charlottetown Cornwall area the undisputed cultural, social, and economic center of Atlantic Canada. Let's bring the Grey Cup to the island. The birthplace of Confederation along with a renaissance of community economic development for our tourism-driven economy. Can we count on your support? Go to altanticmoose.ca for more info or simply to cheer us on. Okay, uh, Ray, thank you. Uh, yes, A um, couple of questions. First one is, um, what company are you representing? Uh, we, I don't represent a specific company other than the Atlantic Canada Moose Initiative. Uh, our concept is a, uh, of this particular initiative is a not-for-profit bringing consortium of community uh, stakeholders. So when we talk about the initiative in terms of organizationally, we refer it as the Atlantic Canada Community Economic Development Consortium. But um, it is a, um, co the concept of it is the bringing together of community stakeholders, including um, any small businesses, government, public, and other organizations that um, uh, want to be part of it. Because the, the concept of the franchise is not to be a private corporation in a sense like MLSC, for example, with a strong bargain on the concept of the, uh, the CFL franchise is to be what would, would traditionally be in the CFL called a community-owned franchise as opposed to a private corporate um, organization. Okay. Um, we obviously don't have a stadium in place for a CFL team, but um, what partners would you have involved and where would your funding come from? to bring a CFL so, to Charlottetown. Yeah. So um, in terms of um, the two, uh, first of all, uh, let's back up a bit in terms of the uh, space. We have been focusing on looking at places in the greater Charlottetown area for the location of the stadium. 
uh, the uh, two uh, areas that we've sort of been focusing on is either uh, land that's in uh, Cornwall, just outside the city of Charlottetown limits, and um, land and potentially, uh, though not confirmed, there's also potential availability around the um, land which is owned by the uh, Charlottetown Airport Authority. But we're, we have not had any sort of, uh, we're still in the process of trying to have some sort of direct contact with the uh, respective um, real estate representatives who look after that, which is Transport Canada. Now, in terms of the money for the stadium the, uh, and, the, and the whole project, we, um, we, we, since we all know that um, in the, on the island and Charlotte specifically, there's a strong deficit in terms of social housing. So in terms of the money for the stadium, based upon our consultation, which we have from, uh, from you know, various corporate, small business, and other stakeholders, the money will come from uh, uh, substantially from what we envision to be corporate stakeholders and any other public interest which sees the um, social component to be important because we cannot implement the social housing component um, without the involvement of, of levels of government. That, would, that is a sort of driving force initiative. This initiative becomes entirely um, private in focus. Um, the that were associated with an entirely funded initiative are not going to be provided to provide for the type of housing that we have provided. So, um, so basically, uh, our concept is that if we're able to obtain the blessings of the uh, city of council to head with further consultation, we will see to what um, going to be uh, what type of um, supporters are out there going to be in terms of money, whether it's corporate or otherwise. To, but we we are not have not been in a position to extend ourselves of that sort of nitty gritty uh, financial issues because we would want a situation where we started um, talking to various corporations and calling the city of Chicago to find out whether they or not. But we knew, so the first step is to any sort of plan to secure actual dollars and cents needs to be um, the, the blessing the council because the, the city council um, a corporation to have a billion dollars initiative nothing can move ahead without the blessings of the city of uh, city council about how much money is available such an initiative. Okay. Um, any other questions, um, Mr. Long? Hey, Ray. It's uh, Wayne Long. Thank you for your presentation. Um, just curious to know, there's two other uh, Atlantic cities who've been spending a, a number of years uh, in this space trying to secure a CFL franchise. Uh, most notably is the Halifax group. Uh, you know that a number of um, Touchdown Atlantic events have been held in that region. Um, typically, a CFL franchise would go to a large metropolitan centre. The greater Halifax area has uh, half a million people in proximity to that area. And in speaking in the past with the CFL, they indicated that they're focused on metropolitan uh, areas. Have you had any discussion with the CFL on this and how such a presentation or proposal would impact the roots and uh, groundwork that has been laid in the Halifax area? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't quite catch your last part, sir, but what we mentioned Halifax. What were you saying about Halifax, the groundworks in Halifax? What was that you just said? Can you elaborate on that? The groundworks in Halifax. Yeah, there's been a what lot of that? routes already laid in the Halifax area and a lot of groundwork. There's an investor group uh, over there who has been working hard uh, with respect to uh, uh, a group within that area. In fact, City Council here in Charlottetown endorsed by way of resolution in December 2018 uh, the efforts of that organization to bring a team yep. uh, to, the, to the region. Yep. And our discussions yep. with the CFL have indicated that they are focused on large metropolitan cities centers in the Atlantic region, uh, such as Halifax and or Moncton. What was your last discussion, out of curiosity? Uh, exactly what, what I just said. My last no, discussion. 
What date? What year was your last interaction with the CFL on that uh, particular it, year? It was a it was a, a year ago. Uh, this past uh, August was my last detailed uh, indication with them, and then most recently spoke with them a few weeks ago, where they indicated uh, anyone can certainly make can make a presentation. However, they're not endorsing such presentations. Uh, we spoke to a representative, an executive of the CFL, and we would not have of uh, pursue this without a written statement from the CFL uh, where, where we specifically mentioned and our initiative to, to pursue Charlottetown. And they to informed us that they were, would enthusiastically uh, look at any uh, CFL franchise from Charlottetown because um, Halifax has been kicking the bucket for, as you know, for over 20 years and Mukton has been kicking the bucket. And the reason why those franchises um, didn't are, are not going anywhere, and uh, the re and why why those particular uh, franchises are pretty much dead, and and the reason why there's no touchdown Atlantic CFL has given up on a touchdown Atlantic because those uh, those initiatives are completely dead, uh, based upon my consultation with the CFL. That's why they went to touchdown Pacific, and that is and it is quite quite easy to figure that out once you go to Halifax, which I've been and Moncton and read these statistics in these in, in environment to back that up. Um, Halifax has, uh, has a serious um, uh, you know, social economic problem, including crime. And Moncton has a serious social economic problem concerning crime. As a matter of fact, I feel a hundred times more safe walking in downtown Toronto at 3 a.m. than I would in Halifax or Moncton and stuff statistically, and you know, and, and with that in mind, you know, I I saw some data in fact that Toronto is the safest um, uh, large metropolitan center in North America. But with that in mind, those uh, cities are too preoccupied with their own. Okay, Ray, I think we're getting problem. a little off topic here. Is there any other questions from anybody? Right here, Councillor Twill. Thank you for your presentation, Ray. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty lofty uh, ambition plan plan that you have. I've been following it as well. Uh, Wayne talked about the resolution. I moved that resolution uh, back a number of years ago to support our, to show our support for the region to have a yep. CFL team here in Atlantic Canada. Um, I've attended a couple of games. Uh, we've shown support from a regional perspective. Um, and, you know, I think you're quite right about Halifax. For whatever reason, they're just not rising to the occasion. And tell me if I'm wrong. They're, they're just not coming to the forefront. They've been given many opportunities. And just so I can get this straight, you're talking about the city of Charlottetown, um, fielding a CFL team here to play in a regular season scheduled game and to participate in the Canadian Football League. Is that what we're talking about here? Uh, yes, Councillor. Yes, that's, that's what, exactly what we're talking about. Um, I, uh, I just apologize for my, my uh, you know, I sort of had a little bit of passionate outburst because I'm very passionate about PEI and Charlottetown and all the support that we've received. So I apologize if I appeared to go a, a little off track, but yes, yes, Councillor. One, uh, the idea is for a franchise in Charlton based upon the idea that Charlton is, and the PI is a very welcoming environment, has a stable economy, and that the people that would be coming to watch a CFL franchise would be supporting the hotels, the businesses, all yes. the money they're spending, I, be bringing money into the economy. I, I understand the economic spinoffs. I understand that. Um, you know, it's <laughs> uh, look. Look, I'd like to see it happen. Uh, you know, I'm biased. I'm I'm from the island football community. I was heavily involved with uh, the revitalization to tackle football in this province. I think it'd be great for amateur football, not just for PEI, but the entire region. Um, you mentioned the the airport property. Have you had discussions with the leadership and management at the Charlottetown Airport Authority? Uh, we. 
we we've been uh, we have a real estate agent. As a matter of fact, he been tr we've been trying to reach them for the past couple of weeks, but we have not been able to um, make confirmed contact. I tried calling them before the meeting uh, today. We're we're having difficulty, but we're hopeful that we can um, re uh, we can uh, have a, an actual uh, uh, verbal contact with them. We're still in the process of of uh, uh, trying to establish that contact. Okay, so. Again, we're just we're just we're brainstorming here more more than anything else at this at this stage. Um, so, are you talking a stadium that would seat at the minimum twenty thousand people? Uh, yes, Councillor. Okay, twenty thousand people. Um, have you approached the other two levels of government, the province and the feds? Um. Uh, y yes, Councillor. We've uh, approached. Uh, well. We've approached, for example, um, MP uh, Heath McDonald. Uh, he seemed to be uh, very interested in what we're doing, uh, but we're still in. We still not got any sort of confirmed sort of a confirmation in terms of what type of support of any they might want to have in terms of written support. But he's he represents, as you know, um, the sort of the Cornwall area in terms of the province. Uh, we're still in the process of trying to. Um, have contacts with the Premier King to find out what he what he thinks about the initiative. But I understand his office is quite busy with all sorts of provincial responsibilities. So we're still in the process of trying to sort of get a feeling of uh, what Premier King thinks and what uh, the sort of the local MPs think in terms of the idea. But everybody that we've spoke to so far has been um, extremely enthusiastic. In Cornwall, for example, we spoke to Kevin that you might know of in the mayor's office of Cornwall, and he said, he told me, quote, who, who, who wouldn't be interested in a CFL franchise on the island? That's what Mr., I think it's Kevin Cody, that's what he told one of our representatives, Peter. So there's generally, all, you know, just a, a, a great amount of enthusiasm for the initiative. It is just about, you know, we're at this stage wanted to just simply, you know, just to get the support for and as a concept because we didn't want to, you know, be speaking to all kinds of corporations and without, uh, you know, getting consulting the, um, you know, city council first and his worship because we didn't want to overstep that. So this is so this is what the stage we were at. You know, we have a website and we have that video and we have the um, urban plan so you can see what the vision is and stuff like that. And then if council thinks that is worthwhile pursuing, then our idea is that we would that would give us a, empower us to at least have further consultations in the community. So, if for example, let's say ADL, which is a major uh, corporation on the island, let's say they were interested in supporting it, they, they would want us. You know, they might call you or you know, councillor or his worship and say, "What's this initiative?" And then you could say, "Well, we spoke about this initiative and da 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 da." So we wanted to um, go through the council first before we started. It getting in more extensive consultations with corporations on the island that might be interested in supporting that. And then once we, I think we might have another meeting with council, once we've had more been able to consult with these corporations and stuff without the council wondering, oh, who's these people? I don't know who they are. So that's basically what the stage we see are at at the present time. But based upon when we, when we had contact with the CFL, because they know that, you know, the, the Halifax is kaput and, you know, and Moncton is kaput. They said, oh, yeah, before a couple, two, three years ago, they would tell us, no, we're, we're focusing on Halifax, but we're not really interested in, doing, you know, looking beyond Halifax. But no, because Halifax went kaput, you know, bef before we started even going to, you know, you, you, um, the council and, you know, the Greater Charleston Chamber of Commerce, we made sure we have a letter from writing. I can forward to you if you want to see it. Which, which okay. Enthusiastic. Um, um, yeah, I'd like to see the letter. I think a good yeah. starting point would be for for uh, the city of Charlottetown to host a regular season game. And to my mind, that would give us a true indication of the kind of support that that uh, I believe you know. Uh, could 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 be a litmus test for such an endeavor. Um, you know, we've tried to. I've tried 
tried to contact the CFL. I mean, I, I did talk to the commissioner at the game in Moncton and told him that uh, we'd be very uh, interested in hosting a CFL game here in, in this province, here in the capital city. And, you know, he, 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 he listened to what I had to say. But I believe, you know, if, if you want to show there's real merit to this, I believe that if we held a CFL game here in the capital city, that could be a great starting point. So if you have, you know, that kind of rapport with the, the leadership and management in the CFL, that would be great. And I'd be willing to work with you to host that game here, here in the city of Charlottetown. So, you know, if we want to go down that road, and, and I, I'm very supportive, let's start with a CFL game being held here in the capital city. Let's start there, right? And, and awesome, awesome. So do you know whether council would be willing to, you know, to make some sort of um, blessing and say that you and count, because if you and council were willing to write something that I could present to the CFL saying that, that the city of Charlton is interested in hosting a game, then, and, and then I would then, then con contact them and, and, you know, based upon consultation with you, I think that if the city, the city council was able to put that in writing, then that would be something very, a very good start for me to, to see what they, you know, you get further feedback uh, from them and for us to pursue that route. Because I think it's a great idea to have a game in Charlottetown to see what the dynamics would be and how people react to it in Charlottetown. And if people are willing to travel from Halifax and Moncton and go over to Bridge to such a the game, then that would be a good testing ground to see how that how that unfolds and how it in, impacts business like a dry run exactly and, you know so, so what we what we could do what we could do is we we could uh you know bring this to council and and uh from exploratory uh you know from exploratory uh, uh perspective you know uh open up the discussions and see what it would take to host a cfl regular season game here in the city of Charlottetown, <coughs> where the game would be held, and um, what the prerequisites would be to hosting that event, and what we could do to making to making that truly a successful event, and that, to my mind, that would be a great starting point. So, if you can help us secure uh, a CFL game here in the city of Charlottetown, to my mind, that would be tremendous. That would be awesome. the ultimate. Awesome. So, um, would you, counselor? So, what would be the step in terms of uh, getting something in writing that I could present to the CFL? Would that come from you, just you? Would you consult with counsel and, you, and get it support from them? Yeah. I'm going to um, let uh, one second. Counsel, uh, Mr. Long is going to answer yeah. that. Uh, Mr. Long is going to answer that, Ray. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just, just want to make the committee aware that I did have this very discussion with the CFL Commissioner's Office in February. Uh, they indicated at the time that they're not focused on Charlottetown for CFL game. That's not to say that we don't have an interest to host one. I mean, I think there's a lot of passion here. Uh, Touchdown Atlantic is not happening this year. It's moving to the West Coast Pacific in Victoria. And uh, that's where they're focusing their efforts, uh, at least for this year and perhaps beyond that. No, yeah, I, I, I appreciate you. One know. more question here, Ray. We're going to wrap this up because we have other so, things in our agenda. So, Council McAleer has a question for you. Yeah, Ray. Just have you, um, have you or your group, or I don't know if you're solo on this thing, or uh, anyway, um, you know, done any research as to um, you know the uh, the need, the desire from f from the island or uh, Charlottetown in terms of data research, like. Uh, um, like they say, there's been a lot of discussion going on with Halifax, and I'm sure there's there was a lot of uh, must have been some research and data that supported uh, exploring that as an opportunity. So, like the you know what any 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 sense of what the demand might be on PEI for this? I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm just finding hard to get excited about it personally. Uh, well, yeah. Well, as I mentioned, we, we've spoke to. You know, members of the, uh, the the business community and different people in Charlottetown, and the, the general consensus that we've received, including you know Ken Cody from the, uh, on the you know city of Cornwall, said who wouldn't support a CFL franchise? So I would say that 
based upon our, our informal consultations, uh, we 90 percent are very positive, and and 10 percent are sort of uh, lukewarm, <coughs> not sure, and uh, zero ne negative. I've not got anybody who says you know that's a bad idea. We've got like about 10, 15 percent that's. So I'm not sure if that should be a priority or not, but they're not particularly against it. But an and 85, at least 85 percent to be uh, tremendously um, supportive. So that's my sort of a, um, informal uh, a sort of a take on that. Uh, but, um, you know, based upon the concept, and this is what has given its impetus to um, uh, forward and stuff like that. But with respect to the council's idea, I don't want to take over your time, but I am willing to, um, you know, make a some you know, contact the CFL to confirm whether they would be entertain uh, such a initiative uh, based upon the preliminary discussions that I've had, and go back to the counselor which made that suggestion and, and give direct feedback on what the CFL thoughts um, are uh, on that are because it seems to be a slight discrepancy between uh, what sort of you know certain members of the city are. Feedback they're getting from the CFL and the kind of feedback of enthusiasm we got to the CFL. So I'm willing to uh, contact this, contact the CFL and confirm whether they would be opening to entertaining a, such a, such a proposal. Ray, what businesses were you speaking to in the city of Charlottetown that endorsed uh, CFL coming here? Uh, we spoke to the uh, city, the Greater Charleston Chamber of Commerce which made their own internal consultations with their own members. And based upon that, they sent us a written letter of endorsement that, that, that was confirmed from the initial support that Paul, that Mr. Godfrey gave the, uh, the, the, you know, the initiative back in about two, three years ago. So the city of the Greatest Charlton Chamber of Commerce made their consultation and gave their written endorsement based upon consultation with their membership. Okay, Trevor. Oh. We'll, we'll, we'll wind this up. We'll, uh, again, I want to thank you for your presentation. What, what I'm proposing here is that the city of Charlottetown um, strike a working committee to uh, work with yourself and, and, and your rapport with the CFL to see what it would take to host a CFL game here in the city of Charlottetown. I think it would be a great... Uh, I think it would be wonderful here for, for, for not only the capital city, but the province as a whole. And uh, I believe that we, we, we would have the support. Uh, we have many members of the island football community who would embrace this idea and, and would show support. So I, I think we should explore it, should explore it. And um, um, I'd like to conclude with that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm willing to, put a mo willing to put a motion on the floor at least to explore the idea of hosting a game here and then work with Ray and uh, his, his people and have further discussions with the, uh, with the business community, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, uh, you know, downtown business, all, all parties that would be uh, enthusiastic about the idea. I think it's time we had to host a CFL game here. Every other province in this country has hosted a CFL game but this province. And I believe it's time that we host a CFL game here in the capital city. So uh, I want to thank you for your presentation, Ray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Ray, for your presentation. We got some discussion here and some questions. And uh, moving forward, we'll, um, uh, Councillor Twill wants to get a motion on the floor. So thank you. Thanks again. And uh, we we'll look forward to speaking, hearing from you in the future. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Long. Thank you. All right. Do you want to do anything now? Yeah, I'm going to do it now. So I'll put a motion on the floor that we uh, uh, collaborate with, uh, with this gentleman and uh, explore the idea of uh, hosting a CFL game here in the city of Charlottetown and to see what the, what the prerequis prerequisites would consist of. And it certainly doesn't, uh, it certainly doesn't, uh, you know, hurt to uh, have that opportunity to, to go, through that, uh, go through that process. So I'm willing to put a motion on the floor, at least to explore the idea. So <clears throat> uh, 
I'd be in support of uh, supporting the motion to send up to council if it's, uh, I think you're primarily saying, Councillor Tweel, is to see uh, what the interest might be in, in hosting uh, a CFL uh, game, I guess, I'm starting there. So uh, I don't have any problem uh, second in that to send it up to council and then uh, my support beyond that uh, would be based on, I guess, on, on uh, what the recommendation would be to come on council on that. Uh, and some debate around it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Motion moved, and uh, thank you. We'll move on. Tax and thank you, John. Tax incentive applications reports, uh, Mr. Long. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. There's a detailed um, report in your package. Um, I'll try to uh, guide you through this. I hope you had the opportunity to read it as there's a lot of uh, moving uh, pieces. So, but essentially, staff is recommending that we enter into five-year agreements with both Dine Holding uh, Inc., which is the Arts Hotel, and then the Charlottetown Area Development Corporation, which is the Bio Alliance incubator in the uh, industrial park, and also to amend the city's tax incentive strategy uh, to provide clarity on commercial development, which, which is currently uh, somewhat loose and fluid. Um, essentially, the city has a tax incentive program, as you're well aware, uh, for the expansion, expansion and or the rejuvenation of commercial properties within the city of uh, Charlottetown. Uh, staff have used the, uh, the uh, calculator to determine uh, the values, uh, which are further on down in uh, your report and eligibility. The Arts uh, Hotel has achieved substantial completion back in February 18th, uh, 2021 and they're requesting a five-year declining incentive, uh, whereas the uh, Charlton Area Development Corporation for the BioAlliance Incubator uh, achieves substantial completion in January 15th, 2022. They're requesting a 10-year uh, uh, declining uh, incentive. However, the policy only allows for five years. The committee uh, in recent years uh, made some amendments to that policy, and that was one of the items that was reduced uh, to five years. It's important to note that both of these applications have been ongoing for some time uh, before um, a number of staff was even uh, here today, including myself on these files. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of time that has lapsed. Of course, this pandemic has been in the, the midst of that. There's been requests, but not necessarily official applications. Uh, there's been conversations verbally, but not necessarily in writing. So it took some time to piece this particular project, uh, pr pr proposals and projects together. So what we're recommending uh, today is uh, a five-year uh, total for Dine Holding uh, in the amount of um, $54,500, and that would be over five years. And then the Charlton Area Development Corporation for the BioAlliance uh, Incubator over five years at a total of $179,100. Both of these expenditures would be um, tax charged to the, uh, the upcoming pending uh, budget fiscal year. Uh, we've accounted for these uh, in our um, in our numbers, and given there's been a, a lapse in time, um, we felt that it's important to bring this to the committee. Uh, there is room within the current policy uh, for the CAO and the Manager of Economic Development uh, to make some decisions within the file, but these are, are broader in scope, and we felt that it would be important to come here. Also, uh, we need to seek some clarity around the fact that the Arts Hotel, while it is uh, a commercial entity, um, it's taxed at both commercial and non-commercial uh, tax values, uh, with the hotels being assessed at non-commercial, although it is a commercial um, operation. So it's reasonable, we feel, for the, kit, the committee to uh, up this to council and consider full value for the Arts Hotel, and then again, uh, support uh, CADC with respect to their requests on a five-year um, declining uh, rotation, and also that staff work toward um, drafting agreements for both of these applications, as well as work toward amending uh, the current policy to ensure that it's reflective of definitions, but most importantly, commercial um, as a whole. Thank you for your report, Mr. Long. Um, so the motion from council to approve, I believe. Council McAleer. Yeah, j just one question. And <clears throat> Wayne, or to uh, either the chair or to the manager, um, 
the the, the bio comments, like you think was indicated, they, their first preference was a ten year uh, a ten year framework, but they obviously, I guess, can live with the five. Well, they requested uh, through the chair council. They requested uh, a ten year. Um, uh, incentive. However, the current policy only allows for five years. I believe previously there was a 10 year uh, on ramp. However, the committee in recent years and council uh, did some cleaning up of that policy and reduced it to five. Uh, so if there was a desire by the committee to go more than five, there would need to be an amendment perhaps to the bylaw or special consideration, which would need to move forward to council. However, the, uh, the calculator that was used in here um, is what we use for budget purposes and what's currently in the budget. And if you're, um, if the recommendation is to request a special consideration, then we would need to be prepared for other applications uh, that come forward, how we best um, handle those. And, and is, um, is the BioAlliance aware of our five-year uh, ask, I guess, or recommendation? Uh, through the, the chair councillor, um, I can't confirm that they're aware of our recommendation. They're certainly aware of what the policy states. They do have a copy of that. We've had that discussion uh, with them. In this situation, the application is coming from the Charlton Area Development Corporation as the owner and landlord of the facility. Uh, we made some amendments in recent times um, to the policy that allows for applications such as that for new builds in the uh, bioscience cluster uh, to be brought forward. Um, so beyond that, uh, I, I can't add too much more other than that they are aware of what the policy states. The other uh, item that I would mention as well is, is that they request it retroactive on this file. However, um, the committee's made it clear before that we're not in a position to uh, manage such requests in a retroactive manner. We use the calculator from the um, substantial completion date, but however, we'll only fund it in the next fiscal period and the years thereafter. Thank you. Um, so do we need motion on the floor then to proceed with this funding? Moved by Councillor uh, McAleer. It's, it's not a funding, it's a <clears throat> tax incentive. Tax incentive. So, so again, we're, 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 we're expanding it from five to ten years. Correct, Wayne? Uh, no, uh, no, through the chair, councillor, we're making a recommendation that both of these applications be funded on a five-year declining basis, which is aligns with the current tax incentive. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Tax you, you mentioned 10. I thought they were looking for an extension. Uh, they are, but our recommendation is five, given the policy indicates the max is five years. Okay, and have you indicated that to them, that that's what you're going to be recommending to the committee, and, they, and are they okay with that? I recommend it to them that we are going to be using the current policy that we have to work from and that it would be a decision of council. Okay, I'll second the motion. All right, that's passed. Thank you very much. Good discussion. Thank you, Mr. Long, for your report. Move along to the downtown farmer's market. Uh, Laura Lee, you're up. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the downtown farmer's market is before us for discussion today. Um, based upon a letter that was issued to Downtown Charlottetown Inc. last week, indicating that uh, the city's event logistics committee would be unable to support the continuation of the market on Queen Street moving forward based on um, several critical emergency response related um, concerns, as well as some concerns about electrical load. Um, after the letter was issued, there were at least two councillors who um, indicated that council had previously entered into agreements with DCI um, to allow the pedestrian mall to be set up uh, to host the market, and therefore um, the conversation should have been had with council before notifying DCI of that recommendation. So we've we've brought that back today to initiate that conversation, um, and DCI has been notified that we we are engaging in discussion today and that there may be a change in the position um, based on what was communicated. So I have provided some background in the report 
uh, just quickly going through that the market was initially established as a partnership between downtown Charlottetown and the city in 2010, uh, initially as an effort to provide activity for cruise passengers and convention attendees as well as tourists who were in the city on Sundays as uh, the state of the downtown at that time saw a lot of businesses only open six days a week. Um, it extends for 13 consecutive weeks between late June and late September, uh, taking place from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. with some time on the front and back end for setup and teardown. And it's expanded over the last 14 years from initially one block to now three blocks and involves over 80 uh, local vendors weekly. DCI has indicated that the average attendance is about 3,500 people. Um, some of the concerns that were brought forward by emergency services have to do with the growth of the market over the last 14 years, but also with the change in activities in the downtown core, even just over the last two years, primarily related to um, the increase in addiction-related um, behaviors in the downtown. I know that the outreach center is moving and, and maybe some of those issues may no longer be at play, but that's still to be determined at this time. Um, so the number of street closures associated with hosting the market weekly, um, it impacts their response times. And my understanding from emergency services is that the event itself is less of a concern than the frequency and the duration. So having it over 13 weeks and having to reroute those um, responses from what they would typically be as in directly down Queen Street um, is becoming a bit of a concern along with the lack of adequate street closure infrastructure. So we're using pedestrian vehicles to block Queen Street on a weekly basis and relying on individuals to be there to move them if they need to be. Um, there's also some concerns around overloading power in that portion um, of Queen Street. So we were notified after a lot of these concerns kind of peaked last, uh, last summer that DCI was going to be recommending to their board that they not proceed with the market after last year. Um, I'm not sure where that conversation went, but DCI did come back to the city in late January and request a meeting to discuss an alternate location, and that meeting was held on February 13th. Following the meeting, the uh, the letter that's in your package was drafted. It was endorsed by the logistics committee, um, and it was also sent through senior management before it was sent. Um, so I guess today we're we're looking for the committee's input on how we would like to proceed. As staff are recommending that council does not renew a pedestrian mall agreement with DCI based on the concerns that have been expressed. Thank you, Laura Lee, for your report. Um, I think if we can have a pedestrian mall or any event in downtown that will bring 3,500 people in from residents and from outside the city, I think it'd be a good thing. Um, I understand the concerns that you, that have been raised in the letter, but, um, I think that there could be guidelines put in place. Is DCI, are they, can, will they cons reconsider if it's offered back to them to come back into pretending they don't have another venue? Will they come back to Queen Street? I would have to ask DCI that question as the conversation hasn't been had, but my assumption would be yes. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, Councillor Tweel. I want to thank, you know, all the discussions and everything that's taking place. Um, and I appreciate the work that staff has done. But I think what needs to happen, uh, I, what I find concerning is that I know discussions are taking place with staff and Downtown Business Association. What I'm recommending, so I can get a better understanding, I need a better understanding. Well, I'm recommending, Mr. Chair, that we don't make any decisions here today, that we have a special meeting with the Downtown Business Association, here with the committee, all members of our committee, and, and, and them present, so we can have that dialogue and that discussion and talk about you know, some of the challenges and, and, and some of the things uh, in terms of timelines and logistics and, 
infrastructure, amenities, all of those things, because I find it hard, to, to be honest with you, is to make, a, to make an informed decision here today and then you know, have people rail on us saying, well, why did you do that and why didn't you do this? And, you know, let's, let's have, a, let's have a, uh, a discussion here with the committee so we can flush out all those, all those concerns and all those issues and then to see what it would take to have the proper infrastructure in place, the proper amenities, the logistics, personnel, everything. You know, so we can go through that, uh, uh, you know, we can go through that, uh, those, those, uh, those requirements. I, I don't want to make a decision here today either way. Thank you, Councillor Twill. I know we're kind of at the 11th, 11th hour here being, getting ready for the summer. Is that something that could be done, uh, Loralee, for the near future to bring DCI in and have that uh, conversation? Yes, I was gonna. I was gonna add that, Mr. Chair, that if that is the direction of the committee, that we should work to set that meeting up sooner than later. As I know that DCI has an extended planning process, so if there is going to be any changes that they need to be notified of, we'll want that to happen sooner than later. Councillor McAleer. No, I, I'm, I'm in support of, 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 of that as well, I guess. Um, I, I know when kind of reading the, reading the material and reading how this dynamic got to where it was, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an unfortunately a good problem that, um, that, uh, that needs some kind of resolution. It's something that, got, that started, I guess, with, you know, with DCI and a lot of good stakeholders, and, and it's, uh, it's grown to be a, a, a you know, you know, a great event for the, you know, for the downtown, for the city. Um, uh, and then I was thinking, well, maybe could they, is there, to, to try to retain it somehow, um, could it be uh, perhaps um, <laughs> some, um, some um, solution as to um, perhaps making it smaller? Obviously the thing is growing, and I wondered, well, would they, could it be perhaps, you know, um, uh, downsized somewhat to accommodate the, uh, you know, the various demands of, uh, of uh, public works and fire and the policing piece. Um, but when I read here in the letter, uh, it says it was understood that following our meeting with these, uh, our meeting with DCI, they're reluctant to alter the size and or frequency of the market. Um, so it, anyway, it. Uh, I'm just wondering with some more maybe dialogue collaboration, um, can there be uh, can there be a s solution to maintaining the uh, vibrancy of this of this event? Be it um, you know it, it sounds like it's a challenge to continue as it is because of you know the, the growth that it's had. But can it be uh, I guess modified some way to still retain the you know the uh, the event itself? Through the chair, councillor, um, that was an option that was discussed, as you noted, at our February 13th meeting, because it, it was not the desire of the event logistics committee to have DCI cancel the market. We've acknowledged it's a, it's a great product. It's um, a great way for local vendors to sell their wares during the summer, and it it's no, um, it's no hidden secret that DCI does great work in the downtown and helps to make downtown Charlottetown a very vibrant place to be. Um, we did have conversations around whether they could shorten the season. So instead of going 13 weeks, can they go fewer weeks at their current size? Can they look to decrease the size of the market and maintain the same dates um, and the the information that was provided by DCI at the time was that it was their preference to leave things the way that they are. They would not like to look at reducing the number of dates that they um, having a conversation around relocating the entire market to an off street um, hardscaped location. And that's when Queens Wharf came into play for the conversation. Obviously it's not city property. So that involves um, conversations with CADC and the province about gaining permissions. But um, there, there was a number of conversations that took place around how we could accommodate the concerns that we were fielding from emergency services while also maintaining the integrity of the market and, and supporting DCI and their efforts on that. We just weren't able to um, reach a point where everyone was in agreement. Thank you for that. So I think 
from what I can understand here, direction is to go back to DCI and see if they will come in sooner than later and have a, a meeting with council and if you committee. fire committee. the committee. Yes, yeah, sorry. And um, if fire or police want to come in and address theirs so as soon as next week, if possible. So okay. I will work with, council. with parties to get something set up for next week. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the CAO. Can we move number nine and seven around on the agenda? Sure. Yeah, just because we have a um, gentleman here for the e-scooters and rather than kick him out for the closed session and bring him back in. So we're gonna go to introduction of new business, e-scooters, gentleman Taz, correct? Mr. Long, you want to introduce? Uh, Mr. Chair, just a point of order. So do we have to move and second that? Yeah, so I want to move okay. at uh, um, number nine. 9A nine. Nine and nine 7 eight, change. I move to uh, number 7 and 7 move to 9A. So I move that. Any seconder? Okay. Yeah. Second by Council McLear. All in favor? Okay, moved. Thank you. Thank you for the point of order. Okay, Mr. Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just want to give a little bit of background on uh, on this file. Um, I understand this item has been added to the agenda today. Um, from a staff perspective on economic development, I've worked with uh, TAF uh, from the inception of trying to launch his business here in Charlottetown as a young entrepreneur. Uh, so helped him uh, with respect to on-ramping his business and connecting him with the appropriate uh, departments within the city corporation, but also working with uh, the provincial government under the legislation, which allows for the use of such, um, such let's go, vehicles, I guess, for the sake of this. So uh, beyond that, um, it's been other city departments that have been involved in this file, predominantly police, I believe, and TAF can speak to that. But from a staff perspective under economic development, we just uh, uh, helped TAF um, launch his business and connect the dots. So I just want to add that as a precursor. Thank you, Mr. Long. i hand it over to Taff for his uh, quick presentation. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Taff, and I'm the uh, CEO of uh, Epic Electric Scooters. And uh, I'm here today to give you our, about our 2023 season update um, what we have accomplished and also the challenges that we are currently facing right now. So um, we are proud to report that uh, the 2023 season um, Epic Electro Scooters facilitated a total of 19,983 rides with uh, 12,537 unique ride riders. Um, embracing our eco-friendly mode of transport. On average, um, each ride uh, covered a distance of uh, 3.1 kilometers with an average ride time of 30 minutes. Our commitment to deliver exceptional service is reflected with the ratings data gathered from 9,894 riders surveys, uh, showcasing an impressive 90% uh, uh, approval rating. Uh, beyond providing convenient and enjoyable rides, Epic Electric Scooters had made substantial economic and environmental contribution. We managed to create 10 seasonal jobs, supporting local employment opportunities, Moreover, our present had a tangible impact on downtown uh, food traffic. One of the most significant uh, benefits of our service is the reduction in car trips. During the 2023 season, Epic Electric Scooters saved approximately 6,661 car trips, leading uh, to a substantial decrease in the CO2 emission by <laughs> approximately 10,000 kgs. These figures highlight the pivotal role of electric scooters playing in promoting um, sustainable transportation and combating uh, climate change. Our 2023 season has marked by success both in terms of ridership and the positive impact we have had on our communities, economy and environment. We are committed to build upon these achievements and continue to be a driving force for sustainable urban mobility. So 
So just to give you um, some of the uh, factors that uh, we had an impact on Charlottetown economy, it include uh, revenue boost uh, on the company and other businesses, uh, tourism enhancement by providing our convenient, affordable and eco-friendly transportation that would be also be used to attract more visitors and increase spending in the city. Uh, job creation, sustainable, sustainability focus with alignment with Charlotte Town sustainable goals, um, collaborative <coughs> partnerships with uh, tourism agencies, hotels, local businesses, utilizing data analytics uh, that we use to improve our operations and also uh, contributing to the Charlotte Town Future Bike Share Program um, whereby we can offer some insights on how to make the program better. For our 2024 plan, um, we managed to secure eight contracts um, um, with, uh, with hotels, education institutions, and businesses. And uh, we have uh, two contracts that are still in the negotiations. These contracts, uh, we, we aim to offer discounted rates to uh, visitors, students, residents without any transportation access. Um, these programs would also be there to promote uh, safety on the whole micromobility sector. Um, we, we have managed to recruit 10 students and youth um, to be uh, our fleet operator associates and also marketing team. We're also going to be doing uh, social media promotions and these campaigns will be promoting our e-scooter services and also be promoting uh, safety in the micromobility sector. We'll also be doing, uh, introducing new features and one of the flagship uh, feature that we're going to introduce this year would include the on-demand on -demand rider education audio. So it works whereby a, a rider, when they unlock the vehicle, the scooter would put out a voice educating the rider about the road, uh, rules of the road and how to ride the e-scooter. Um, for this year, we'll also be collecting data on uh, riding data so that we can do some technological improvements and uh, development that can enhance our uh, service quality and also safety. We'll be doing an ongoing collaboration with the law enforcement, um, whereby we'll be working with them closely to identify and address issues promptly. We would also be starting our services um, on April 1st, which is this uh, coming Monday, um, so, so that we can be offer our services in the shorter season to accommodate the increased demand of uh, our services. Another feature that we're doing is we are, we'll be rolling out um, our MEP version. Uh, we call it uh, version two, and it's just coming up on the screen now. So that was our version one MEP in uh, 2023. We upgraded it to our 2024 version two MEP. And as you can see, there's more restricted zones, there's more um, low speed zones, and uh, all these uh, zones are created uh, by the data that we collected last year. In 2023, uh, we faced challenges uh, that were brought to us by uh, city police. And uh, these challenges include uh, riders not wearing helmet, underage riders, impaired riders, nighttime visibility, and uh, not obeying uh, e-scooter regulations. We made a uh, progressive solutions that we introduced and integrated into a system uh, that includes a helmet delivery system, ID verification program, reaction test program, and also a 10 p.m. curfew, STEM atmospheric lights, and pre-ride education feature. And this uh, safety project costed us about 245900 With our collaboration with the police, uh, the timeline include um, in July of 2023, uh, they approached us with the uh, issues that they have identified. And then from July to September of 2023, that's when we we're doing our safety updates to address the issues. And then in October of 2023, we got acknowledgement from the city police on addressing issues. Uh, we also requested uh, for the city police to uh, 
uh, remove the curfew they initiated on the business, uh, which was 10 p.m., uh, but they were not looking to remove the curfew at that time. The reason why we requested uh, to remove the curfew is we wanted a more, more reasonable curfew whereby riders would be able to use our services from um, Sunday to Thursday, 24 hours, and then we shut down the business at 10 p.m. on Friday and Saturdays. The reason why for shutting down the business on Saturday, Friday and Saturdays, 10 p.m., is because of the more vibrant bar scene uh, in downtown Charlottetown. We were willing to work towards that, but the city police uh, said um, they are not looking to remove that for now. And then as of uh, March 2024, the city police is looking to pause or suspend our services until an e-scooter rental bylaw is established, and that could be a one to two year wait. And then of this March 2024, we decided to retract the curfew request as uh, we have a more pressing issue of getting our services set up again. Implication of pausing our services, um, as I mentioned, uh, we have eight contracts uh, with hotels, education institutions, and businesses, and along uh, two contracts that are under negotiations. And these um, uh, contracts are set to default uh, in the 2024 season if uh, services are paused. Uh, the employment impact, uh, as I mentioned before, we managed to hire 10 students and youth who will be facing unemployment uh, in the uh, 2024 season, creating a significant social and economic challenges for them. Destruction of residential services, we have around 10,000 users who rely on our company services, and in 2024, they will experience disruptions affecting their daily transportation needs. The, implica the other implication is uh, halting our safety and educational program, which we think is very um, critical as um, the, um, there's a lot of safety concern around the whole micromobility sector in Charlottetown, and that would include the e-bikes, bicycle, e-scooters, and uh, the company uh, was planning to create educational pro uh, programs with, uh, with non-profit organizations in Charlottetown and be able to push education awareness so that there's an improvement in the whole micromobility sector. And then loss of data and technology insight. Um, we think that the uh, city of Charlottetown will lose access to val valuable data and technology insights from the company that would be hampering its ability to enhance transportation services. Um, and that would be including the future bike share program. And then we have uh, last mile connectivity challenges whereby our residents uh, will lose a potential last mile connectivity solution leading to a decrease in overall transportation options within the city. And then coming to the financial strain and risk um, for the company, uh, seizing uh, operation could uh, exacerbate the company financial situation, putting it at risk of defaulting, resulting in loss of investment and in technology advancement aimed to address um, the issues that we faced. Benefits of letting uh, Epic Electric Scooters continue um, business would include the data collection for the, up, uh, the future bike share. Um, as, as, as we are the only company uh, operating as a shared micromobility business, we are able to gather data that can be used for a successful bike share program. Um, we'll be also able to offer insights into micromobility challenges um, aiding the city planners in developing effective strategies, technology sharing, collaborating with, with the city. Uh, the company can also share the technology that we have and strategies for their innovative for the bike share program. Residents can gain access to last mile connectivity solution, improving overall transportation and uh, city accessibility. Uh, we'll also be able to offer diverse transport, transport option um, promoting inclusive, inclusivity and uh, flexibility in transport, and also be able to contribute to the economic, the economy. And uh, that will be all for my presentation. Thank you. Trevor? Thank you, Taf, uh, for your presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but I'll let uh, Councillor Tweel uh, begin. 
Thank you, Trevor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for being here today, Taff. Um, you know, you outlined yourself. There's uh, there's some challenges, and uh, to wait for a bylaw would, uh, you know, suspend the operations one or two years. And you have a big investment here in the city of Charlottetown. Um, I've heard some of the figures. I don't know. I don't think it's uh, important to note how much money you invested, but uh, I would be in favor of, you know, you working more closely with the uh, police departments, all departments for that matter, maybe even signing some kind of a, a temporary agreement, uh, uh, working towards a bylaw. Uh, we do need a bylaw, there's no question about that, but uh, for the formulation of a bylaw, one or two years, I know trying to get other bylaws in place and for whatever reason, for whatever reason it takes, seems to take an extended period of time, but um, you know, if we can address some of those challenges, I know that I've, I've sent emails off to the police department, uh, some concerns I've heard from residents, um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we can't work together. And I think we should be able to work together. And, you know, even we can come up, uh, Mr. Chairman, with some kind of a temporary agreement um, uh, until we get a bylaw in place and to work with this gentleman, uh, you know, in the business that he's bringing to the city so that it's, it's safe and it's secure, predictable, consistent. So everyone knows the ground rules. You know, for example, you know, uh, you know, you can't be on the boardwalk, uh, sidewalks, you know, interfering with the seniors and pedestrian traffic. Just, just some issues like that. If we can get some kind of a, an understanding and some kind of a, a working agreement in place, uh, I, I think I think a lot can be accomplished, and and to to um, have those discussions, and to try to deal with the issues, uh, you know, right away whenever they pop up. Uh, I, I I can't see why we can't uh, have our police and other departments work together to to alleviate some of those concerns. Um, I I'd be certainly willing to try that. Uh, I'm not in favor of shutting down your business. That's, 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 no, I, I don't agree with that. I agree that we should try to work through some of those issues and, and come to, I believe, a favorable resolution. Uh, I do want to thank you for being here today. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tweel. Um, no, I agree, hopefully, that we can work together and get solutions so business can carry on. Any other questions, Your Worship? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so we had a standing committee meeting last week for protection and emergency services. <clears throat> and I think there was a meeting that occurred prior to that, week or two weeks prior. But that being said, here's what was in the report to the committee. <clears throat> in February, February of 2023, permission was granted for scooter rental business to operate through Charlottetown. So that permission wasn't granted by council. Okay, let's not let's make that clear. That wasn't that was I believe it went through economic development and then police. That's 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 the 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 the, uh, the trail here. As a pilot project, over the summer months of 2023, Charlottetown Police had received numerous complaints concerning these scooters, including now listen to this: no helmets, riding on sidewalks riding on the boardwalk, riding through red lights, riding through stop signs, underage operators, scooter drivers cannot be seen at night and driving while impaired. That sounds like to me like cyclists currently in the city. You walk anywhere in this city, cyclists are going up one ways, uh, going through stop signs, not wearing helmets, like that we have an issue already. And I know when I was first elected in 2018, 2019, we were bringing this up to our police services. We got a helmet bylaw, let's enforce. And, and there's a provincial helmet bylaw. So we have the bylaws there, we have the tools. And driving while impaired, it's a motorized vehicle. And we know that if you're driving an e-scooter or an e-bike and you're impaired, 
That's a DUI. Like, the tools are there. It's not like we don't have the tools. Tools are there. But to, just to, you know, take this e-scooter business and say, no, that's where all this is happening. This has been going on for a long time. Like, we have a bylaw. No helmets, you get fined. You go up one way, or you're driving on, uh, riding on sidewalks or the boardwalk, there's a fine. Like, we have to start using the bylaws, the tools that we have. And, you know, like, I, I know at our meeting, we were trying to look at the timeline, but I know it was discussed at economic development last year. I know it was. And at first, it looked like a great idea, and it is a great idea. And this young guy, Taff, a student, a new Canadian, he was told, we brought him in. Remember, Taff? We brought, brought him in to say, Taff, you have to clean up. You know, you have to make things work. I've seen this young guy, this young person, out on the streets, on corners, picking up his e-scooters at 11.30 at night, right? So if you talk about sweat equity, he has it. It's not just the money, it's the sweat equity. He was asked to make sure that the helmets, you know, you couldn't operate it without unlocking the helmet. Okay, so you unlock the helmet. Then you see e-scooter e uh, operators with the helmet on their arm. Okay, so if that's seeing, you get no helmet. You get ticketed. So tools are there. We have to use the tools. And I've heard, well, there could be other operators. Well, you know what? He's a non-conforming user. He's, he's already in the business. So if we have to develop a bylaw, which we should, and that's why I went to Municipal Affairs, and last June, they, and I, I thought I passed it on to s someone in the administration, but June 2023, June 2023, love them or hate them, e-scooters are on the way. That's the title in uh, the uh, uh, Municipal Affairs magazine about what other municipalities are doing. Regina, Mississauga. So the data is there. Now, I couldn't get into the article because it asked login. I don't know the login, so I'll have to get it later on. But I will get it and pass it on to the appropriate departments, economic development and, and our uh, protection and emergency services department. So, of course, the article that was referred to last year when I did an interview, Paris banned e-scooters. They had documented 15,000 e-scooters. But the turnout for that plebiscite referendum, I think of all of Paris, was 5% of the population. But it was an overwhelming, no, we don't want e-scooters. So they banned them. I'm Look, I agree with Councilor Tweel. We don't always agree with each other. But this guy, young fellow, this young person by the name of Tap, a university student at UPEI, a young entrepreneur, and has put a lot of work into it. Let's find a solution. Like, the deputy mayor knows, and we discussed it last week at our uh, Standing Committee for Protection and Emergency Services. This is, this is operational. No, we're now into it. When we were brought into it because of it going through the Department of Economic Development, Tourism, Festival Events, then came to police services, we're now into it. We got a decision to make. And I think that we have to work with TAF and ensure that, look, Taft, there are regulations, but we have a duty as a municipality, Taft, to ensure that if you're not wearing a helmet, you're going up a one-way, you're going through a stop sign, you're impaired on an e-scooter, e-bike, you can be fined for DUI. So let's, let's try to work something, but let's look at the bylaws. We're, we're, we're not uh, reinventing the wheel here. There's lots of examples out there, templates that we can use. So we... We're not starting from scratch. And can we shorten the time frame? We should be able to shorten the time frame to work. Uh, maybe hire someone that will look into other municipalities that will come back with a proposed bylaw for e-scooters, which I don't think will be much different than what we have for cycling now in Charlottetown. No helmet, you're fine. Drink and driving, yeah, you, it, it, there are consequences. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and I agree with you. We have the tools, we have the laws, we have the bylaws in place. They just need to be enforced, and uh, I have an e-bike. I'll, 
last summer I saw more people wearing helmets on the e-scooters than I did on the bicycles around Charlottetown. So I think we need to work with uh, this gentleman, get um, get some regulations in place, curfews, times, restrictions. I have a question, Taff. You said about um, speed restriction zones. Can you regulate those on your app? So a certain area of the city that they're automatically the scooters will be slowed down. And another follow-up question, on your survey, was it more residents than tourists that used the bike, or do you know the differential of, of uh, your user? Thank you, Chair. Um, can I answer? Um, yes. So from my understanding, the bylaw that needs to be made is not about e-scooters. It's about e-scooter rental companies. That was my understanding. Well, from you know what, Taff, good question. So what will, yeah, what will the bylaw be on? Mr. Chair, do we know that? I'm What's getting a nod from another counselor in the room. That, that is correct. It, it will be on regulating just e-scooters? Who, who's given that nod? Okay, but I think administration, does administration have an idea of work with what this bylaw will be about? Yeah, I don't know if it's just about e-scooters. I think this, this bylaw, like, like Mr. Chair, let me just add another component to this. We're looking at bike share, e-bikes. If you've been in Toronto or Montreal, have you seen bike share, how it works? A lot of people don't use helmets. So, like, like if we're going to, that's why I said this is a bigger issue than just e-scooters. It's about cyclists. It's about bike share. Like, there's a big issue, lots of contributing factors to this issue. So, whether it's rental, e-scooters, let's find out what the bylaw is going to be. Oh, yes. So what I meant is um, the police is looking to regulate the businesses, not the e-scooters. I think they've got to go hand in hand, do they not? Sorry? The bylaws would have to go hand in hand. Yes. So, so my assumption was um, maybe the bylaw would be regulating... Um, the whole micromobility sector, um, yeah. But just wanted to to clarify that um, for them to the police wants to wait for us for the e-scooter rental business bylaw, and uh, we we have been in compliance uh, with the city police ever since they brought up the issues. Uh, we have very advanced technology. We are the only company in the Atlantic region to be offering this kind of technology into to our service. So we hope that we'll be able to come up with an agreement with the city police and be able to work with them whilst we're waiting for the, uh, for the bylaw. And then pertaining to your question about the, uh, the speed restriction zones. So the way it works, everything is automated. So, for example, we have put a restriction zone in the downtown area. The maximum e-scooter can go in the downtown area is 15 kilometers per hour. So let's say somebody is coming from University Avenue and then they enter Great George Street. The scooter will slowly, gradually reduce the speed automatically and then it will alert the person on the app that the speed has been reduced. They won't be able to go anything above 15 kilometers per hour. And then um, comes to uh, the red zones. Um, for example, the boardwalk. We red zones the boardwalk. So if a person starts riding the e-scooter on the boardwalk, the e-scooter will sound an alarm and the throttle will disable so they won't be able to accelerate. So even if they try to accelerate, the scooter will not accelerate. It would to tell them on the app that they have to move away from the boardwalk and go on the bike lane or on the road. Okay. Yeah. And your user group. Oh, um, so we for for so when we are organizing uh, between tourists and uh, uh, residents, we use the area code. So we seen that uh, almost uh, uh, between 60 to 70 percent 
of our riders were residents. Okay, thank you, Tav. Um, it sounds like you're already making some changes to help move forward, and hopefully we can come to an agreement this year. Yes. If we have to wait for a bylaw, it's not gonna work for this season, in my opinion. Any other questions? No? No? All right, well, thank you very much, Taff, for your presentation, and we will we'll continue the discussions. Mr. Chair, right, just before you. we close, so what what what's the timeline here like what what's the proposal from 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 us what what are we like we, we're having this discussion so our next step is what to continue on a bylaw to regulate e-scooter rentals or is it a bylaw to well i would like e-bikes mr like chair mr e-bikes also they all can get to up to 25 to 30 kilometers so 32, are we going to put 27, 32? Are we going to put hour, uh, so. governors on on e bikes too to to ensure that they just keep within 15 kilometers? Like, there's a lot of questions here yep. that I think we just picked one that we thought we we could start chiseling away. But you, you have to do the the holistic take a holistic view. Current cyclists, traditional cyclists, e bikers, e scooters. They, they these all have to be part of. The, the, the future discussion. No, I agree. I think we need to start moving forward on working on a bylaw, but I think we still need to come to an agreement to allow uh, TAF and other um, e-bike rentals or e-scooter rentals, any of these companies operate for the summer. Councilor McAleer. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, I, I'm certainly in support of, of uh, uh, trying to uh, be part of uh, a solution for um, you know for the for you know for map here and his you know his e-scooter business, but in in spite of uh, I guess the police recommendation is to pause in the meantime. Is there what's the um, what's the solution or the workaround to if he is kind of to continue to operate? Is is that um, uh, I? I <laughs> If um, if he has the support of uh, you know this committee or if it's a, a council decision, how does uh, I guess we run run counter to what our police you know are saying? Like what uh, what kind of position? I'm just trying to think out loud. Does that put <laughs> does that put us in as a as a I guess a city, Miss Pally, in terms of you know the bylaw, the whole kind of can. Um, can this gentleman, in spite of the uncertainty and what has to be worked through, uh, can um, can this gentleman still continue in his business in spite of the police recommendation? Yeah, I was going to say it has to go to the police to deal with the bylaw. But look, here it is. Uh, I know the deputy mayor and I have discussed this earlier before. We got this. I call it the Berlin Wall between the operational and the political, okay? So Berlin Wall between the operational and the political uh, form, which is where we are right now. And we're being, like, we were told to stay out of the weeds, so we were the weeds were brought to us. We discussed it. As soon as we discuss it in a political form, we take ownership. That's where we're at. So, you know, we... Whatever decision we make, it's going to now be a political decision. This this was to be channeled through the the operations, meet with TAF. TAF only found out about this because of the discussion we had here last week. Did you know about it, TAF? No, I had no idea. We had the impression um, in October that uh, we address the uh, issues effectively with our features that we introduced and uh, we're good to run for this year. That's why we made contracts with hotels, education institution. Yeah. We're actually getting ready to launch on Monday. So at this point, we're just, I don't know. So Taft called me. I don't work in operations. I'm on the political side. So now I'm into it. I can't say, listen, Taft, that's operational. Well, no, well, why did you discuss it at a standing committee? That's what we need to uh, address here, guys.
CAO Eleanor, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, through the chair to your worship. So at Protective and Emergency Services, uh, when this came up, there was a recommendation that council um, put everything on hold uh, in order for a bylaw to be prepared. So from an operational standpoint, we, we can't stop this, right? So that's why the recommendation was to come through council. Only council can make a decision like that to take e-scooters off, off the road until a bylaw is prepared. So everything leading up to this point, yes, was operational. The business operating goes, goes forward. Um, so the reason why the, the report came through protective and emergency services and ultimately to council was given all the issues that the face um, police were suggesting that the e-scooters should be put on hold until there's a bylaw in place. And that requires a council decision. As a result of our meeting the other day at Protective and Emergency Services, it was, it was felt like there wasn't enough information um, in the meeting and the person um, from police responsible for it wasn't available to answer some questions. So we needed to go back to have a better understanding of how this came into effect in the first place. Um, for instance, can the business just go ahead and operate? If council does nothing at this point, can the business just continue to operate the way that it has been as long as it's meeting um, the Highway Traffic Act? So those were the kind of answers that we needed and we didn't have on the spot. So there is to be another meeting of protective and emergency services. And I think in the meantime, there can be a discussion with police about the business being able to continue as planned um, for April 1st. But ultimately, like the difference between the operations and council is operations doesn't have the ability to say, no, you can't use scooters in this city. Only council has the ability uh, to make decisions like that. Thank you. Sam. Can I just clarify that? So the bureaucracy can permit it, but then to deny it, it's a political question. Is that what you just said? I just want to get that clarified. Does it say no? So uh, th thank you, through the chair. So that was the information we're still trying to get our hands on. Like the city doesn't do business licensing in order for um, a business to operate. So what we need to figure out, like I, there was no permit given as far as I understand for, for you to operate, was there? So uh, we requested uh, parking with So we requested um, parking location on city property, um, which was uh, worked on with uh, Public Works. And then they sent it to us, we signed it, and then we sent it back. And then we're given the go-ahead to continue using those parking spaces. And then um, according to the police, um, the business was being run under a traffic bylaw. I'm not too sure of the very specific um, what, what bylaw? a traffic bylaw. Trap. Yes, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure of the very specific bylaw that uh, we were operating under. So that provides a little bit of clarity. If there's a bylaw ahead of time that enables this kind of business to operate, then we're not going to come to council for that to operate. But when we're turning around and saying something cannot operate, like scooters can't be on the road, that's something that's outside of the purview of operations. If there's no bylaw that says that, then that's a new ask of council to regulate that. Um, but again, I come back to, we need all this background information um, in a report that would go through to council. We don't have that here today. Um, and it's Protective and Emergency Services Committee that is looking at this. Okay. Thank you, CEO. Your Worship, anything else to add? So this young entrepreneur, a new Canadian, is wondering where does he go now? What does he do? And if I look, it's under, again, TAP referred to it as the traffic bylaw. Okay. I'll look under that later. Yeah, so... From what, what I understand, he, April 1st, he can go ahead 
because there's no bylaw or council hasn't decided to say you cannot operate. Am I wrong in saying that? If I am, somebody correct me. So you're saying because there's no bylaw in effect, come April 1st, he can continue to operate? That's, that's my belief. If we don't have a bylaw or council decision to say you cannot do this, then... I would check with police first. But if there's no bylaw... I would check with police to see what the model was of how this started. And that's why we were to get the information and bring it back to protective and emergency services. Okay. And I would just, for the record, if we're going to shut down e-scooters, we have to look at e-bikes and the whole gamut across the city. So anything else, Your Worship? No, nope. like that's it for me, there. sir. No, I, I think we should get, get an answer back to TAP as soon as possible. Yeah. Uh, from the operations part of the organization. Councilor McAleer? No? Good. All right. Thanks again, Taff. Thanks, Taff. I need a motion to move into closed session. Moved. Closed session as per the Municipal Government Act. Uh, motion by uh, Your Worship, seconded by Councilor McAleer. Moving to, under the Municipal Government Act of PEI, Section 119, Section 1, Section E. A matter still under consideration for which the council has not yet publicly announced a decision and about which discussion in public would likely prejudice a municipality's ability to carry out its regulations, uh, a hosting agreement.
into open session. And number eight, we have no business arising from the closed session. Uh, yes, you do. That uh, there will be something going forward to council, but at this time, point in time, it's okay. not. It's, it's not business, available. But it's going to council. Yep. Recommendation going to council yep. for consideration. Okay. Thank you. And motion to adjourn. Council, <laughs> your worship. Johnny. Thank you.